I, I'm trained as a classical musician. And you know, it's like, it's like a racing horse. You are trained to do something very well, to excel on that one thing. And if you start taking other paths, all the other horses are gonna race past you. You're gonna be... Welcome to Conversas de Jardim. It's a video cast which is taking place in our secret garden. A garden in which we both will walk, and so take a relaxing chair, sit down, and listen. I'm Steven, and I have the honor to encounter amazing people from Portugal that has a meaning in different areas of society, be it artists, businessmen, having something to do in politics, but people who have an impact in society. Today, we have Martim Sousa Tavares, who is a very young componist, dirigent, active in music in Portugal. But I will not reveal more, because Martim is here. And actually, for the first thing I always do is, people have my trademarks, I give you some very colorful socks. And at Thank the you. same question, what are the meaning of socks to you? Well, uh, thanks, Stephen. Should I put them on right now? I think better for tomorrow. Better later. Okay. Um, socks are actually a fun part of my life. I have a sock subscription. And Great. The, the ones I have on right now, you've already spotted them. Yes. It's Gustav Klimt. The ah. Kiss. Beautiful piece of art. That I will Kokoschka, show. Alma Mahler. Yes, exactly. The so whole this period is, of uh, This is Vienna. sending me to Vienna. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fin de siècle. And uh, being a classical music nerd myself, this is the world I like to live in, so it's nice if I'm also walking on it. But it also sends a, a message, I think, which is you shouldn't take yourself too seriously, in a way. And even if you have a, mar a masterpiece turned into a pair of socks, that's, that's okay. You know, I'm not doing harm to the masterpiece that's hanging in Vienna. And this is kind of what I do with classical music as well. I try and put it in odd places and try to have people interact with it in a, in a new way which doesn't damage the old way. If you still want to listen to classical music in an auditorium with your program notes on your hands in that silence, that's okay. I will do that for you. But if you want to listen with a glass of beer on your hand, or if you want to do an Insta story, or if you want to bring friends and walk around the musicians, I think there should be an opportunity for that as well. So in the end, the socks are that. Well, when you move towards classical music or whatever music that you want to be contemporary or, or, or adapt. What is for you your purpose in life? My purpose is that beauty is accessible to all, regardless of who or where or what they are uh, in life. I think it should be accessible to all. It's, uh, it's, it's a primal right that we have and it lifts us as citizens, as human beings, and it brings benefits to society at large. So I chose music because I love music, because I started playing as a kid and all. But then you come to realize that you're not there just to give a nice moment to people. It's actually more important than that. And there are people who are not benefiting from it yet. So it should be your task as a citizen slash artist to correct that. Because I was very privileged. You see, I was was raised in a capital city, I was lucky enough to go abroad and study and see the world. And that could have been my bubble, you know, but I decided to pop the bubble and see what's out there. And things are really different. And in Portugal, for example, most of my work has been away from the big cities, working with people who don't have access to this yeah. kind of culture. Tell, tell us a bit more about that, your, your impact in society aspect. Well, I think, May, if, if I died today, um, God forbid, I think I'd be remembered as someone who really strived to democratize the access to culture and classical music specifically. I, I created an orchestra when I was 27 years old, and that orchestra has two purposes. It's in a small town in inland Portugal, right on the border between Portugal and Spain. We offer this music to those populations. Because if they wanted to hear an orchestra, they'd have to get in their cars and drive uh, 300 kilometers. And that was the reason why I came back to Portugal. I was in the United States prior to that. And 
everything unfolded like a snowball effect because this project became very well known in Portugal and it won a number of prizes and then I got more and more work uh, like big institutions wanting me to do the same approach for them that I'm doing over there, which is interesting, kind of turning things upside down. You start working from the periphery and then the nucleum will want you to do the same. I can imagine that, okay, this is what you're doing now, but I don't see you continuing doing the same things for the next 10, 20 years the whole time. So what are your dreams and what are the additional plans you have in that aspect? Well, you, you know, that's, that's actually... Um, a sensitive spot for me because I, I'm trained as a classical musician and you know it's like it's like a racing horse you are trained to do something very well to excel on that one thing and if you start taking other paths all the other horses are gonna race past you and you're gonna be left behind and I started doing that years ago like my life right now is a kaleidoscope of things I do radio I do television I write I compose music I I do a host of things that are not just conducting the orchestra. And I don't see myself doing it any, any differently. And I'd say that in 10 or 20 years, I, I hope I'm doing even more varied things, things I haven't experienced yet. Mm. That would make me happy. So you said I compose, but also write. What do you write? Well, I write mostly music for theater and soundtracks. Uh, I'm not so interested in writing just what's called the pure music, like symphonic music. Yeah. I'm more interested in working with other artists. So theater or dance is very interesting because there are demands that are non-musical. Like imagine you are writing music for a choreography and the dancer needs to cross the stage and they need music to cross the stage. And you write the music and the music is 15 seconds long, but the stage is 30 meters. They need 40 seconds to cross the stage. So you need to extend your music. Yeah. It maybe was not your musical idea, but you have to adapt because mm -hmm. they are human. They need that time. And I love this sort of compromise and creative inputs that come back and forth because I can also influence the dancers. Uh, and I pretty much love this idea of working together as opposed to being isolated on my own studio and coming up with the music and saying, this is it, I'm back to my studio now. Let's go back when you were a kid. You said I played as of a young age. Mm -hmm. I mean, who, in, who told you or who was your example or were your parents who said you will play or it, uh, you heard the Beatles and I said I will play? Or... <laughs> no, no, it was uh, a, lot, a lot less interesting, I, I suppose. My parents uh, divorced when I was about five or six and I, I stood there alone with my mother and while she was away at work, I had a lot of empty time on my hands and at some point, I guess she thought it was a good idea to bring a piano into the house and have the kid have some lessons. And eventually what happened, it was like planting a sprout and then watering it and then having sunshine come on it. And eventually it started uh, blossoming. That's really what happened. It was completely uh, lucky. My father is tone deaf. If you ask him to sing Happy Birthday <laughs> or to sing the national anthem, he will not be able. It's the same song. Yeah, it's always the same, like he, when he whistles, it's, it's always the same thing and I know yeah. it from memory. Whereas my mother, she enjoys music but she doesn't know much. It's like when you have kids and you want yeah. them to do fencing or uh, scuba diving or whatever sport it is, just so that they're occupied, you know. That was kind of what happened with me. But you had the talent. Well, who discovered then, because there's a difference in putting a piano in house and you're, you start doing it and you start to have lessons, but somebody must have discovered this guy has a little bit more than just talking the piano yeah. or doing, he has a talent for music. So yeah. who, it's, it's, who, who, um, who got your potential? It's that, that saying, it takes a village to raise a child. It, it's the same with musicians, athletes, whatever. It takes, the first teacher is always super important because they are the ones who get the raw material. And they have the chance of killing the raw material if they are severe, if they, if they get you traumatized, you're not gonna go anywhere near a piano. And so, I'd say the first teacher is really the most important because that's going to be the door opening yeah. for you. And my teacher was actually a young man himself who must have been 18 or 19, but he was uh, serious enough to give me proper training in a non-traumatic way and, and let me enjoy it. I remember yeah. choosing the pieces I wanted to play. I remember doing some very sluggishly uh, but 
still improvising on the piano and he was encouraging of that. And then at some point it was time for me to proceed. So he was um, earnest enough to say, okay, you've had enough with me. We've reached the limit. Now you need to step up your game. So that was the moment I went into a proper music school. And then from there you go to another teacher and another until you reach that defining moment when your teacher asks you, is this what you want to do for a living? Because if the answer is yes, then you're going to have to do a lot of yeah. compromising and a lot of sacrifices. And to me, that came about the age of 18, I'd say. Is that the same in, in your path, kind of? We are in insurance. It's a never-ending story of discoveries. But did you also have like a first teacher no, encouraging? No, no, I mean, it was very, for me, it was much simpler. I, I started in trading. And I was, I mean, the trading rooms in those days, it's the 80s. So you still have these movies of uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Exactly. That, that was you. That was the that was the atmosphere I was okay. I was living in. And wow. then the whole dealing rooms. There was not one with a university degree, and I had tried already fifteen people to get to start in the dealing room, and everybody was fleeing out of the dealing mm. room. And so they came to me and they said, "You know, you look like a guy who will survive. So uh, why don't you start doing that?" And so I entered. I said, "Everybody's fleeing. That's my job." Yeah. But. Who is discovering your talent now? Because you cannot be saying, listen, I'm my age, mm. I have no potential anymore. There still should be people saying, you're not at the end of your talent discovery. Yeah, so I who think, is challenging you now? I, th I think it's not an individual. I think it's more of a, a, a phenomenon that's happening sometimes in a community. Like I perform a concert, say, in one of those villages. And it's the reaction of people. It's what they say after the concert. I don't have. Yeah, a, that was my question. I don't work actually. for anyone. I'm yeah. I'm self-employed in a way. Uh, I have two orchestras now. Uh, I'm running a festival. I, I have a lot of teamwork around me, but I have to feed off of collective inputs. It's yeah. not back to a teacher or a mentor anymore. I, I'm I'm very happy that you involved and that you went to all these schools because I must confess that I have a neighbor who started playing piano during COVID. Mm. And every day I had to live with Edelweiss. Yeah. <laughs> and we're three years later, and I'm still con every time confronted with Edelweiss. Then it's probably a grown up. Well, yeah, it's, of yeah. course it must be a grown up, but I think I'm, I'm getting a little bored with the teaching lessons upstairs yeah. there because they're not progressing. So, uh, yeah, you should go there, knock on the door, no, and play the, <laughs> I don't, the music. I don't. What, what annoys you when you conduct the. What would annoy you most of one of the. Orchestra players while you conduct. Oh, it already happened. Yes, but what? I what, was, what do you say? Oh, come on, this is not. Possible. I was. I was gonna kill one person one See? time, and yeah. and my my producer says he had never seen me fuming like that. So imagine we are playing in this important festival where the orchestra got hired, and it was a big deal. And we had a soloist, pianist, coming from Germany, also super big deal, and we are playing a piano concerto. The hall is packed, the artistic director is there, everybody, and we are playing well. The thing is going well. And then we reach this very soft ambience what part. What piece was that, you still remember? Uh, yes, it was a uh, Shostakovich piano concerto. And it's very melodic, and then a phone rings. And I'm used to a phone ringing, but the phone was inside the musician's pocket. Ooh. Yes, double bass. And I saw, well, I, first of all, I heard that the phone was coming from the stage. And I immediately scanned the orchestra and I see this guy stopping his bow and reaching into his pocket and, and calling it off. Human make mistakes. Yes, they do. And I had to forgive the guy. What does Marvão say to you? Marvão says uh, a great case of success, actually, of a place like there are many in Portugal. This little town, very picturesque, within a castle walls, that was completely forgotten and abandoned and only a few crazy tourists ever went there and because of culture in this specific case because of classical music it suddenly appeared on the map again life is back again thanks to this visionary dude who decided to do a music festival there i think that that's not a secret that ag has always have been immediately involved in culture it's an, it, i don't see that many following that suit which we would like to have because the more people or supporting culture, the better it is for the country in the end. Why, why is that? Well, I think... Um, because the money is there. It is, it is. Uh, 
I still think, and I'm very critical uh, of this, especially having lived in the USA for some years, where society works op uh, on the opposite uh, of what we do. Here you can expect funding from the government and you can expect to be endowed and all of that. Over there you, you don't. You have to go after uh, your own philanthropy and your own grant writing and, and all. And what I feel is that the cultural organizations, not just in Portugal but in, in Western Europe at large, still rely very much on, on this and they still talk about uh, being endorsed and we see culture as something that that needs endorsing and not investment for example Mervon is an example of that Mervon is not giving receiving a penny from the government until a few years ago they have they had to build the whole thing from scratch I'm, I'm very uh, sympathetic to that because I did the same with my orchestra we we still receive zero uh, from from the government when you think about an author or literature who would you say Stephen, you really have to... Albert Cossery. He practiced leisure. He was a writer, and an amazing writer, but he only wrote one sentence per week. That was his rhythm. Oh. At least that's what he said. And in fact, he lived a very long life and only wrote, so wrote eight, one, one book eight small what? books. Yeah, <laughs> eight in total. And what he said was that when I'm walking the streets of Paris and I'm empty-pocketed, I have nothing, I have no possessions, and I see people with good cars and jewelry, stressed and all, and I feel like a prince. And I feel that you are all my slaves, because you have not realized what life is. For me, Kosteri is this inspiration, because I hate working. If you would be, let's say, 95 years old, and you're on your last breath, what would be your thoughts of, yes? I'm happy. I'm ready to go because I did this. What would be this, this? I think it would be to not have been afraid of trying things new, challenging, scary, or unknown. I My agree. relief would I be, I was really unpredictable. Yeah. Kudos to me. I'm ready to go. Uh, in my early days, I was a singer in folk, folk music. Oh, no way. All uh, dressing and, and all. Oh, but I had cool. very long hair, right? Okay. And, uh, and a, and a Basque... Uh, Are there photos of that, that that you could show on the vlog? photos, but they're completely censored for everybody now. <laughs> uh, but I was singing Irish, Irish, whatever, German, French, Flemish... Wow, did Italian. you have a stage name? No. Okay. No. But we were going from city to city to sing, so it was, oh. was a lot of fun. With all, all new instruments, of yeah, course, yeah. Middle Ages instruments. So Why did you stop? Uh, why did I stop? I never stopped singing. Well, but you stopped I still touring sing. at least. Yeah, I, I stopped singing with them, but I still, okay. I mean, I still sing in my shower or whatever. Mm -hmm. Actually, in the car, I always sing. Nice. Yeah, I always sing. I love to sing. So that's uh, what I do. What question did I not ask you that I should have asked? Well, you could have asked me uh, about what I expected of this. Yes. I was actually curious because I had met you twice prior to this in complete uh, different circumstances and I was curious if you were going to recognize me from both. I don't. Because you see so many people. Yes. Yeah, I, ex I, I suspected. No, honestly. It took you a while to link back yes, to the, the dinner we had two yes. months ago. Yeah. I have, I have a big problem with recognizing people and, I, and the whole company knows that and names I think I stopped remembering names after three months I was in Portugal. Okay. I said, Stephen, this does not make sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, in three months I had met 50 Pedros, 30 Joaos, yeah. <laughs> 60 Ineses, mm -hmm. and Maria. And so it, it, it is a real problem for me. But I'm wondering if we meet in the supermarket on the line for the cashier two months from now, will you still remember me? If, you, if you're wearing shorts and sandals... If and I have you, my Gustav Klimt socks you, on, will you remember uh, that? That okay. I will remember. <laughs> All right, I'll make sure I'll bring them next Immediately. time. Immediately. I mean, you wear your shorts and those socks alone. Okay, okay. And I will surely... Or your swimming suit and those socks, I will okay. let you know who you are. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It was uh, really very pleasant talking to you. Likewise. Discovering you. I hope so also for all of you to discover really 
who is behind this famous conductor. Well, I cannot say conductor. He's a writer, he's a composer, he's a conductor. He's doing all things that everybody does as a real artist. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Thank you, Steve.